University is where people from all over the country come to experience the standard of excellence. This standard has been upheld since 1868, when the school was founded by General Samuel Chapman Armstrong to educate not just African American students, but Native Americans at a time when they were not welcome in many places of higher learning. This is the story of how the Hampton Institute, now known as Hampton University, welcomed Native Americans to its illustrious institution to be educated and civilized in this world. On April 13, 1878, an experiment in Indian education began at Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia. The first Native students were newly released hostages from Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida. After ending the Red River War in the Southern Plains, the U.S. Army selected over 70 natives, mostly comprised of Cheyennes, Kiowas, and Arapaho men. While they were held hostage, the officer who was guarding the prisoners, Captain Richard Henry Pratt, and a few women began teaching the hostages how to read and write. Three years later, the War Department released the hostages. They were given the choice between going home or returning to the East to learn more of the white man's road. Pratt wrote to different agricultural and labor schools asking them to take in the natives into their school. Hampton's founder and first principal, General Samuel Armstrong, was the first and only to respond to Pratt's request. He wanted to take one native as an experiment, but Pratt convinced him to take all of them. Fifteen of the new former hostages chose to come to Hampton and 22 decided to remain in the East. Dr. Vanessa Thaxton Ward has worked as the director of the Hampton University Museum for over 30 years. So Hampton's uh, program that began in 1878 was different from many of the other boarding schools. Um, one, I believe, because Hampton Although they were acculturating um, the students or assimilation was occurring, they were still trying to maintain much, many things or aspects of the culture of the American Indian students. Uh, these students came here, um, instead of being prisoners of war, they were sent to Hampton. So many came as adults, um, and uh, eventually as the program continued, you know, more younger students came, but really the beginning were adults and Hampton uh, integrated these students in the classrooms with the African-American students. Danielle Moretti Langholtz is the director of the Thomasina E. Jordan American Indian Resource Center and administrator of the interdisciplinary Native Studies minor at William & Mary Public Research University. Her research focus is on the political resurgence of Virginian Indians. It's very different from when it was started with Richard Pratt bringing some people who were, uh, some uh, young men who were pre former prisoners of war at Fort Mary in Florida, but they all came uh, freely. He suggested that, and they all came freely, and apparently it went, went very well. They, they didn't just work while they attended Hampton. For an hour each day, they met with teachers and other Hampton students to learn English. This class was enjoyed by both the natives and the teachers. Native students worked during the summer in carpentry, farming, and other disciplines, which helped them to earn money for their clothes. Because the school was such a success with the natives, Armstrong wanted to bring more natives to the school, especially Native women, because he believed that there was no civilization without educated women. Armstrong received challenges when he recommended women to be enrolled into the school, but he still fought for them to join. Finally, Armstrong got his wishes and was allowed to bring in more Native men and women to the school. Additionally, he was given $167 per student to help pay for their boarding, clothes, and incidental costs. Since then, the amount of governmental funding remained stagnant throughout the school's whole existence. I think that uh, General Armstrong was uh, a man ahead of his time, for his time, uh, putting that in context uh, with the, the period that he was living. And I do think it was a good idea that he wanted to educate Native American women and African American women, and that the, the classes were um, integrated, so they were in classes together. Of course, you know, we have that beautiful photograph of Memorial Chapel with early students sitting there. So men and women were separated. Um, and there were very strict rules uh, as far as dormitories and visitations and all of that. But no, I think he was really spot on to educate women, both African American and Native American, and others. After arriving at Hampton, the Natives changed in many ways. 
they began attending church and praying to the Christian God. Some also changed their name to conform to American society. The hand that once held a bow and arrow is now holding a plow. The voice that once called to animals now sings Amazing Grace in the choir. Um, the adjustment uh, for many may have been difficult, um, particularly in the earlier years. Um, and so, uh, you know, some went from, as we have a photograph, going from the blanket into the uniform. While attending Hampton, the natives were focused on their studies, but they also found time to do extracurricular activities. This included Girls Club, St. John's Indian Choir, the Wigwam Orchestra, the Indian basketball team, and most importantly, Talks and Thought. Talks and Thought was an important publication for the natives as this provided a space for them to create and document their experience while at the Hampton Institute. Post-graduation, many of the natives fulfilled their dreams and aspirations by becoming professionals such as teachers, U.S. employees, housekeepers, and bookkeepers. Former student Jacob C. Morgan graduated from Hampton and was involved in Navajo politics, working against the government's stock reduction policies and in Indian reorganization. Another former student, Susan LaFleche Picot, is one of the first Indian women to earn a medical degree. Kevin Brown is the former chief of the Pamunkey tribe. In the 1980s, he attended the Hampton Institute on a scholarship. It was really good for me. I mean, I, I had a really good time there and I learned a lot. Um, and it was a great experience. I, I really don't have any negatives. Um, it was just a long way for me. I was driving back and forth. It's like a two hour drive each way. And so that was kind of difficult, but um, it, was, it was great. Uh, I didn't have any, I really don't have any negatives at all. It was just a, a great experience for me. I learned a lot. It was a great program. Many Americans disapproved of the Native Americans and African Americans not only receiving education, but receiving education together. Some feared the influence each group would have on one another, especially in the context of interracial relationships. As the only black school educating Indians, Hampton received widespread criticism in the press and from the public. Pratt insisted, there will be no collision between the races here. These Indians are here to work. Charles Allen works at the Hampton University Museum as the assistant manager of the archive. Um, ultimately, it was difficult at the beginning, I will say. Um, it was a lot of separation. Um, probably one fourth of the Indian population that was here actually associated with the rest of the school as opposed to just their own kind. But eventually, over time, the numbers changed. Over time, they became more comfortable. Over time, the fusion and the, the disagreements became non-existent. However, race was not an issue for both the natives and blacks. One staff member reported about the experiment that both groups happily worked alongside each other. I would say maybe not here on the campus, but I do know of instances in the city of Hampton. Uh, for instance, American Indian students were allowed to go to the um, church in downtown Hampton, I think it's St. John's, and the African American students were not. So I do believe some of the Jim Crow era and uh, segregation that occurred during early years um, probably affected that as far as the relationship or the treatment of African Americans versus, versus the American Indian students. The native and black students did not stay in the same dorm. The Indian cottage, now named Wigwam, was built to separate the natives away from the black students. Leela Hedgepath formerly taught special education in Baltimore, Maryland, in Hampton, Virginia. She was the former leader of the United Native American Missionary Group which was made up of about 60 people annually traveling to Native American reservations. And they had the wigwam, is where the Native Americans stayed. And um, whenever you would go to the canteen, uh, you would go past the wigwam. And the Native uh, students, well, they always excelled. The Native students excelled because they had to come from their reservations and other places. But that was so wonderful when they had their uh, the uh, native dormitory. They called it the wigwam, but it was the dormitory. Booker T. Washington, who all of us know about, um, up from slavery, he was the house father or dorm director that we call, that as we call them now of the male um, uh, Indian um, 
dormitory, which was Wigwam Building. Armstrong offered Booker T. Washington the position to be house father to the Indians. According to Washington, there was a general feeling that the attempt to educate Indians at Hampton would be a failure. Therefore, he proceeded cautiously with his new position. It was not long, however, before he felt he had the full confidence of the students. Even though interactions with the natives were going well, one thing Washington noticed was that the natives had lost their true selves. He remembers, the thing that I disliked the most was to have their long hair cut, to give up wearing their blankets, and to cease smoking. But no white Americans ever think that any other race is wholly civilized until he wears the white man's clothes, eats the white man's food, speaks the white man's language, and processes the white man's religion. Washington found little differences in learning abilities between black and Indian students. In 1912, Hampton had a transformative year. It welcomed its second principal, Dr. Hollis B. Frissell, and lost the government funding for the native students. Booker T. Washington, Frissell, Virginia Representative William Atkinson Jones, and other supporters pleaded for the program to continue. However, their pleading was not enough. Texas Representative John Hall Stephen pointed out that the attendance of the natives dropped because they felt that they had other options available aside from Hampton. Stephen also brought up the topic of race. Why humiliate the Indian boys and girls, our wards and dependents, by educating them in the same school with Negro children? It seems to your committee that we should use our own school, own teachers, and separate these two races and thus elevate the red race to the level of the white race and not degrade and humiliate him, sinking him to the low plane of the Negro race. Again, I don't know if it was really because of the races mixing or things were changing as far as um, the status of American Indians and, and funding, I'm, I really don't know particularly the detail without going into some, some research myself. Um, but it did phase out, and so it may have been money, because some students were able to uh, afford to come themselves. And then, of course, in later years, with some funding from NASA, we were able to, to bring uh, Native American students back to Hampton in the 1990s. The Native students responded by writing a letter to Senator Charles Curtis of Kansas to show their disappointment in the government's decision to end the program. We make this plea to continue support not merely for ourselves, but for those who are to come after us seeking the education which Hampton alone has to offer. Nowhere except at Hampton can Indian boys and girls receive normal training for teaching at the expense of the government. At Hampton, we live in the atmosphere of Christian service and we thoroughly appreciate what we receive and have been receiving from highly educated men and women who are interested in us as individuals and not merely teaching Indians for money. Over the years, the Hampton Institute had approximately 1,387 Indian students representing 65 tribes attend the school. 194 were Oneida, 173 were Sioux, 112 were Seneca, 64 were Omaha, 63 were Winnebago, 61 were Cherokee, and 51 were Chippewa. Once again, Hampton opened its doors to the natives, and this time it was through a scholarship program by NASA. In 1996, 11 students identified as American Indian through the American Indian Educational Opportunities Program were enrolled at Hampton University. This scholarship program gave the native students an opportunity to continue their education at Hampton, but in 1997, the program came to an end, again due to money. I believe it was NASA, um, they had this funding and they worked with not only Hampton but other uh, schools where Native American students attended already, like in Pembroke, North Carolina, there's a big population. And so I guess there was the need, as many others, all of us have needs for scholarships. And so um, the program at Hampton, because of our historic program, Hampton was selected. We hired Dr. Paulette Molin, who um, assisted us with this gallery. She served as the director of that program. And so we were able to, um, again, have American Indian students to come to Hampton, and they did receive scholarships uh, to attend. Today, the hope of opening another program to serve Native American students is slim to none. However, Hampton's legacy of educating the natives is an important mark on not only the schools, but the nation's history in its relations with the Native American population.